So um, let's talk about what it was like to work in the Augment Group. And um, there was a scene there where you actually ended up living in the office. So basically, <laughs> you know, just tell me stories. It wasn't me. <laughs> <laughs> you weren't living in the office? No, there was another person. There was, there was someone that so lived So you in had a stallman. Pardon? You had a stallman. You, the, you know, stallman was the famous hacker at MIT who lived for years in, in, at the Laboratory of Computer Science. We, well, we had someone like that, except it wasn't really for years. It was, uh, it was fairly short-lived. And uh, what happened was SRI, our, the uh, lab was on the second floor of the SRI building. And when you were coming in from the parking lot, you could look up and you could see the row of windows that was behind the lab. And there was somebody that did indeed live in his office for a while. And that worked fine until he decided to take his clothes and put them on clothes hangers and hang them out the window of the lab. <laughs> And the director of the lab came in one morning and looked up and saw some clothes hanging out the window. <laughs> and that was pretty much the end of end that. End of residence. End, end of that, that's right. Yeah. yeah. Did you ever work around the clock? Yeah. I mean, that was, you know, sort of de rigueur was, was uh, you'd typically get involved in something. And, uh, yeah, it was fairly, that was fairly common in those days. I mean, you, know, you, you tended to work much more according to what it was that you were doing. Uh, and if you were on a project and, you know, you'd be working with these conceptual things that would have a lot of complexity and a lot of, you know, different aspects and you'd have all of the parts sort of, you know, all the pieces apart on the table and then you'd keep working at it until it was done and that was, you know, that would very frequently involve working overnight and then, you know, sort of sometime in the morning you'd sort of straggle off and go home. And at, at night you had the computer all to yourself? Well, that was one of the, that was the, one of the other reasons for working all night was the, uh, you know, the, I mean, Doug said earlier that you really noticed the response time up to about a half or a quarter of a second. And when you had the computer all to yourself, in fact, you got these incredible response times. And you could just get, you know, ten times the work done in the same period of time than when you were sharing it with other people and had to wait for, uh, for things to happen. Right, right. And, and there, was there sort of a culture of Friday afternoons that, what, what happened? Well, this, this, this became a little bit of a tradition that uh, every, every Friday afternoon there was a group meeting, as it were, uh, and this was part of the community thing. We would meet not only just to sort of to socialize, but also to talk about issues that had come up during the week, not only of technical sort, but, you know, interactions and things like that. Uh, and so it became sort of a, a social communication, collaboration, uh, you know, time. And, uh, you know, we'd, uh, we were sort of infamous, I guess, within the halls of SRI because usually we would occasionally open a bottle of wine or something like that. Of course, this was unusual, but uh, we would occasionally open a bottle of wine and... No and pizzas. It wasn't a pizza, cr pizza and beer crowd. It was definitely more dialed toward the red wine or... Well, no, actually there was the beer aspect too. As a matter of fact, one of the... Uh, I, I, in particular, uh, during those days, uh, what should I say, I like my ale. <laughs> and uh, you could get these small three-gallon kegs and so I made a little stand that would hold a three-gallon keg, and occasionally on Friday afternoons we'd bring that out and set the keg up on it and, uh, and uh, have our meetings. How big was the Augment Group at that point? And sort of a, I mean, dozen oh. people, two dozen people? Yeah, 15 to 25, I'd say, sort of in, the, in that area. Uh, and I'm just going by feel, not count, but I think that's about right. Uh, they were. And at one point you actually worked for Augment from Sebastopol. Um, what was the sort of, what was the, I mean, was it experimental or did you just not want to live in the Bay Area? Well, it was a little bit of both. The, uh, there was a fellow that, you know, when I, when I first joined the, the group, there was a, a fellow there named Don Andrews. And Don Andrews, uh, after a while, moved up to, uh, to Sebastopol and began working remotely with uh, what at that time was sort of the most modern teletype you could get, which is a silent 700 communicating at 300 baud over a telephone line. Uh, and about six months later, the, uh, you know, I was able to reach an agreement with, uh, with the guys in the group, and I moved actually fairly near Dawn, not intentionally, it could have been anywhere, but that, that happened to be where I moved. Uh, and we put in a, uh, a high-speed telecommunications line, which was all of 2,000 baud. In order to do that, the, the telephone company had to come out, put in a special wire, run it all the way up to the house, and then they had these big boxes like this that were called line conditioners. And uh, you know, with all of that, they were able to get up to 2,000 baud for the modem. And then we, well, I was going to say, and then we had that hooked up to a uh, 
to what was probably the first personal computer in some sense. It was called an IMLAC PDS-1, which was a uh, small display that had a little, pr little processor in it, an 8K of memory, uh, and it was designed for communications and for, for it had a little vector generator display so you could uh, write little programs for it. And were, were you guys the, the world's first telecommuters? Is that possible? Well, we were early, I think. I mean, who knows, who knows who the world's first telecommuters were? But we were certainly, uh, I mean, that was one of the things that we were experimenting. You know, this goes back to, the, to one of the things that we were looking for in the group, or at least I think people were looking for, were what are the appropriate lifestyles for this technology? Uh, one of the concerns I remember very distinctly is realizing that if you were this heavily involved in technology, then you couldn't have a normal life. Uh, and so the question was, how could you begin to have some of the things that were important in life at the same time that you were pursuing technology with this intensity? Uh, and so for me, the idea of working at home and having an office in the home where I could be near my kids and my family at the same time, uh, you know, working these very complex systems and working with intensity was, was, was possible. So, so it was all sort of, you know, I, I think in a very real sense, part of the, you know, part of the exploration that was going on. When you were working on the sh shaky ro the robot team, what what did you hear about? What led you to Doug's group? Well, that's sort of a, an interesting question. I, I think that if I had to pick any one specific event, it would have been the uh, Fall Joint Computer Conference in 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 '68. Uh, I'd been aware of what was going on in the group before that. And it was one of those things where it became more and more interesting. I mean, the Shaky was a fairly interesting project, and I was doing some interesting stuff on there, uh, working with some vision processing and some things like that. So, the, you know, it wasn't uninteresting by any means. But, but for me, what was going on down the hall, and it was just down the hall, uh, was compelling. The, uh, you know, I became aware pretty quickly in, in just doing what I was doing that computers were barely good for uh, number crunching, but they were really good at manipulating information, at storing information, retrieving information, moving things around. Uh, and so that particular aspect really interested me, and the stuff that Doug was doing was just, I mean, it just clicked. Uh, it was the right way to go. And you know, that included not only you know, just sort of the, the specific things that were demonstrated at the, uh, at the Fall Computer Conference, Fall Joint Computer Conference, but you know, just the, the vision as well. I mean, it was, it was pretty clear to me that this is what they were good for. And so, you'd, you'd been involved in the uh, free speech movement when you were in Berkeley. Um, in the second half of the 60s, when you were working at SRI and there was all of this chaos around and the student anti-war movement, did, did it come up for you as an issue, personally? You know, it really didn't. I mean, you know, the, it was... I think that as a group that we were so convinced that what we were doing was important that we'd already resolved in our minds that at some place, you know, th this money was coming from the Department of Defense. Uh, and, you know, we all, all felt that what we were doing was, you know, made that sort of, sort of irrelevant. In other, words, in other words, I mean, we were all conscious of it, and, and I think we talked about it, uh, but we felt that what we were doing was really a good thing. And so when, when the demonstrations were, you know, were taking place, I think we just pretty much avoided them. And it wasn't a, you know, we weren't unsympathetic with them by any means, uh, but you know, it really wasn't much of an issue. Yeah. And all of, the, all of the counterculture stuff that was happening around, I mean, was your life so taken up with building the system that you missed some of that stuff? For example, did you go to the Fillmore, um, the music scene, or was that just something that was happening in the background? It was really something that was happening in the background. You know, it, it was the kind of thing where I think it was important. Uh, and it was important because if for no other reason, it provided a very friendly contact on the outside. In other words, it, it was something you'd be very, you'd be comfortable around because it was, you know, we were sort of doing a lot of counter, we had a lot of counterculture concepts and ideas and, and, and feelings, but, but you just didn't have time to be heavily involved in it. Uh, I mean, you couldn't, you know, be working on the kinds of things we were working on and be spending a lot of time doing anything else. It was just sort of the way it was. Was the, did you see, you know, when you sort of talk about the sociological aspects of Augment, the sort of the kind of work groups you were building, mm -hmm. did you see them as new or anti-authoritarian anti or, you know, alternative? Was that the framework at all? I think new and alternative are probably better, you know, better terms. I, I think there was a certain disrespect for the establishment. And I think that 
you know, part of that was, I mean, this doesn't, you know, this does, this perhaps isn't the right word, but it, it was almost a, a feeling that the establishment was was incompetent or was considerably less efficient than it, than it might be. I mean, incompetent is a very unkind word, and, and so I shouldn't use that. But, but there was a real realization that if you looked at how things were done officially and how things were done on the whole, uh, it just wasn't as good as it could be. And it was clear at the same time that we were dealing with the medium with some tools that could make it, you know, significantly better. Uh, so I think that was sort of the, you know, the feeling towards authority. I mean, you know, it was uh, just feeling there was a better way. And at that point, if you talk about sort of the establishment culture, when you talked about computer cultures, it was IBM. I mean, that was <laughs> white shirts. And, sure. and but did, were you, did you feel like you were an alternative in that sense? I mean, did you know about that world of computing? Yeah, to try and put this in the proper perspective, in those days, IBM was to a programmer as Microsoft is to a programmer in these days. It was the evil empire, if you will. And, you know, they were viewed on as being very bureaucratic, uh, not innovative, you know, sort of behind the times, and sort of an anathema to, to anything that was moving forward in computer science. Uh, so that was the position that IBM had. It was big blue. They used to, you know, talk about the sales force of the big blue was capable of selling a uh, three-foot walnut cube at a profit. <laughs> so they, there wasn't a lot of respect there, and, and, and I, think, I think that, uh, that most people you know, tended to look towards some of the other computer manufacturers and, and in other directions. Now, you never sort of made, the group never became so tight and insular and closed that you approached cult-like. Did it ever, did you ever feel like you were in a cult because you had this vision of the world that was so different than the outside world? I think quite the opposite was true, actually. I think that, that nobody felt like they were in a cult, but from the outside it probably looked like we were fairly cult-like. Uh, at least I would imagine that that was the case, because, you know, we certainly looked at things in some, in some different ways than, than what was typical at the time. Uh, but no, I mean, there wasn't a, you know, it's, it's, it's one of the things that was really kind of neat about it was, in the, I mean, it was a tight group, and I think it had to be a tight group because of sort of all the stuff that was going on, but it was a very expansive group, and, and it was very accepting of new ideas and different ideas. Uh, and there were a lot of different personalities in the group, and, you know, that was one of the things that was wonderful about it. And so there wasn't, you know, to me, cult sort of has a, a certain narrowness, and everyone thinks the same way, and, you know, it just wasn't that way in the group at all. Uh, back to the fall joint event. Um, in fact, you know, let me just expound on that a little bit. One of the things I always really enjoyed was, and one of my good buddies in the, in, in the group was a guy that was a hardware, you know, one of the hardware gurus. He'd go around and fix things when they broke. And this guy was, uh, used to be a uh, jailer in the Marines. He used to run the brig. <laughs> you know? So this was about as far as you could get from somebody that had come out of Cal or, and, and, you know, was in the free speech movement or something like that. But still, we all, you know, we all got along very well and we're all good friends. Now, I got the um, impression that, I mean, you're someone, you're a coder, you're someone who rolls up their hands and writes code. And to what extent were you unusual in this group, or was there a democracy of people who actually wrote code? Or did you carry a lot of the, you know what I mean? Uh, no, actually, I'm not sure I do. Well, I, I mean, how many people were actually, of the, of the 25 people or 20 people, how many actually were actually writing software? And how, much, how many were doing other things? I would guess that probably a few less than half were writing software. You know, there, there, was, a, there was very definitely a hierarchy within the group. I mean, there was sort of a, a core group of people uh, that, you know, worked on the system, if you will, the NLS system. Uh, and that was a very tight group. The, uh, in fact, one of, uh, <laughs> when I first joined the group, you know, there was this core group existed. And, and one of my first experiences was, you know, I mean, I was sort of this young kid and I was a little brash and I went up and I said, well, can I have a copy of the code so I can, you know, do some, whatever it was I was supposed to do. And they said, no, you can't have the listings. <laughs> and I sort of did a double take and, and uh, you know, that eventually got resolved. But it, it was, you know, it just shows the tightness of that inner group. I mean, there was really a, a strong... I mean, it was, it was a click, and it was, it was pretty hard to break into. And, and then there were, you know, some of us that were sort of on the periphery or the outside of that click that would cross in, in and out. Uh, and for myself, you know, I was certainly one of those. And actually, I, in retrospect, I think that was, you know, I kind of enjoyed that because what I ended up working on were a lot of projects that were a little bit outside of the, uh, you know, the, 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 the core of, of, of NLS that, you know, sort of went to some different places that I wouldn't have gone to otherwise. Yeah. So I wanted to get to des describe, describe your emotions or your intellectual feelings or s your reaction 
to seeing the fall joint computer conference demonstration because the only thing I can, I mean, you know, I saw Alto in, I saw Alto in 78 and I mm -hmm. had this aha mm -hmm. yeah. feeling. But what was the feeling? Was it as abrupt or, you know? Yeah, I mean, the only way I can describe it was, yeah. I mean, that was just, you know, that was the feeling. And it was, uh, it was instantaneous. I mean, it wasn't sort of looking at it and saying, gee, that's an, inst you know, that's an interesting idea. It was just, it was an instantaneous, you know, connection. And uh, there was uh, just no question, but th this was the way things had to go. D did, did you have any inkling what was coming? I mean, you were around. Had you already heard about it, or were you taken by surprise? Uh, well, I'd heard about it, but taken by surprise. Surprise is not really the right word. And, you know, in, in a sense that I hadn't anticipated it and I hadn't, you know, really sort of seen all the little things leading up to it. But it was, for me, it was so intuitive and it was so exactly where it should be that it was more like just finding something that should have been there. Uh, and so it was sudden, but I wouldn't say that surprise was, was, was the right word as much as it was just sort of, you know, it was, it was right and it was there. And there was a real, for me, there was a real instantaneous connection to it. Yeah. I th I, I'm still trying to get at um, the, the relationship between what was going on in the Bay Area and what was going on inside the group. And I was wondering what you remember about the people who were clearly part of the counterculture, who were also crossed over and were in the augment, and if you can look back and see any ideas flowing in. You know, any, any, whether they're anti-authoritarian or whether they're de democratic or whatever the sort of things were motivating people in the Bay Area having an effect on the augment group. I think the answer is yes, but not in the obvious way. And, and, and the way I'd characterize it is the group was not very anti. In other words, what the group was concerned with were, you know, what the possibilities were. And so even though you know, individual people would have feelings about, oh, well, you know, I, I'm not happy that this is going on or I'm not happy this is going on, what went on in the group was discussion of new possibilities and where things could go and, and how things might be. So there were a lot of people that came through from the counterculture. I mean, you know, we talked earlier about Stuart Brand and you know, David Evans was always bringing things in and, and Jim Fadiman was sort of, you know, there were these people coming through all of the time, but most of the discussion was not how bad things are out there, but rather, you know, here's some great new ideas and here's some things we could do with them and this is the way of the future. I mean, I, I really, you know, my feeling at least was that that was really the sort of the, the mentality as opposed to trying to resist something, something that was going on or, you know, protest against something that was going on. Yeah. But did it feel like there was, it was a time of ferment? I mean... Oh, yeah. Absolutely. I mean, things were changing. Things were changing you know, dramatically quickly. And, and, and I think all of us thought things were changing faster than they actually were. You know, the, uh, I mean, even, even now, I look back and, and, and I'm astonished that, you know, earlier we were talking about the Fall Joint Computer Conference and that demonstration, how it didn't really change the level of funding. Uh, I still, that still boggles my mind. <laughs> I mean, I, I find that amazing. But, but in fact, I think that, you know, the, you know, we in the group probably thought that things were changing much more quickly than they, than they really were. I got, the, I, earlier in talking to Doug, I got the sense that Doug was a little bit isolated from the outside world much more so than the people in the group around him. Is that possible that he was really, even then, so focused on this one idea or one set of ideas? I don't think I would characterize it as isolated from the outside world. I think Doug always had a great awareness of, of what was going on in the outside world. I, I think that, that, you know, Doug was sort of balancing three balls in my view. Uh, one of them was the vision. And, you know, mind you, Doug's vision was broad enough and was good enough and his conviction was great enough. So he's carried this for 50 years. I mean, you know, if I can carry vision for six weeks, I'm doing pretty well, but he's carried it for 50 years. Uh, so that was sort of the driving force down the middle, I think. And, and, and you know, and everybody bought into that, or at least, you know, certain parts of it. I mean, there were always disagreements and stuff like that. But, but the main thing, people, bought, people, you know, bought into and everyone, that's why we were there. Uh, on, there was one side of Doug that I didn't see very much, and I was pretty well insulated from, and I think most people in the, in the group were, but that was the side that was getting funding. You know, Doug, he struggled for years and years and years. I mean, nobody ever came up and said to Doug, I can see that what you're doing is going to change the world. Here's a whole pile of money, go do it. 
it was always, well, I'm not sure, you know, and, and so he was always struggling for funding. Uh, and that took a lot of, you know, I mean, in doing that, he had to interface to the government and the government agencies, and, you know, that gets into grant writing and proposal writing and, you know, sort of that whole set of things that, that really didn't have much to do with what was going on in the group. Uh, and then on the other side, you know, Doug was, was trying to guide this community, this developing community, uh, and that wasn't particularly easy either. I mean, Doug says he wasn't very good at managing. Well, I think the truth of the matter is, is that would have been an impossible group to do anything with. You know, there's the famous comment about managing programmers is like herding cats. Uh, well, you know, these were primitive cats. <laughs> now, I, Doug didn't seem to remember the generals visiting. Do you have any memories of ARPA coming through to visit and, you know, the augment culture and the ARPA culture and any kind of interesting, you know, dichotomies or? A little bit. You know, I remember one time when uh, this was after I was living in Sebastopol and so I was a telecommuter when uh, some of the project monitors were coming from ARPA were coming out and, you know, the project monitors, at least at that level, were all in the military. and. Uh, they were going to make a site visit up to Sebastopol because we had all this equipment in here, and I was very nervous about it. And so I went through and you know, cleaned everything up, got everything so it was just right, looked very businesslike to make sure it was clear that this wasn't a boondoggle. And you know, these guys showed up, and they were just totally loose, laid back, friendly. <laughs> I mean, I was so far off in assuming what they were like that you know, it was the, perhaps this is something that was more in our minds than it was in their minds. Did you ever get to meet Licklider? Did he come through enough that you got? I met, I met Lick Leiter at MIT oh. uh, when it, you know, went, for some reason went back there and, and visited with him. Yeah. Uh, but I never spent any particular time with him. Yeah. So. And, you know, the Mac project was famous for, you know, having a Bosendorfer in the lobby and rock and roll music playing and, you know, or Joan Baez on the... Did, did you guys have that kind of a cultural ambiance? I mean, I think somebody mentioned music. No, I don't think so. You know, there, there was a... Any word I think of is going to get me in trouble here. <laughs> but there was a certain arrogance at Apple, uh, and a certain feeling of entitlement that went along with that that just didn't exist at, at, at you know, ARC. Uh, you know, I, I think there was a, I mean, we, you know, I, I just don't think we would have thought of, of, of having that kind of a sort of a, it's almost a, I guess, a rock band culture uh, there. Just nobody thought of that. Um, not the culture, perhaps, but um, do you remember music being played in the workplace? I remember people playing music with headsets because you know it was an open work set workplace, and I think if anyone had played loud music, I mean we'd have music in the Friday afternoon gatherings. But so far as other than that, I mean you know people would have music in their own office. Uh, sometimes there'd be you know they'd have headsets on and things like that. But but by and large, I wouldn't say that it was a for me at least it wasn't a critical part of the culture. Uh, the you know the center of the there was a, a a ring of offices and we all had our offices and then the center was a bullpen and that's where the terminals w were and and that was generally more of a of a library than. A, uh, you know, than a rock, you know, rock band, you know, rock bar or something like that. And was it a water cooler in effect? In effect, a sort of social meeting place? Did that? Did the terminal room become a place where there'd be a lot of interaction? Uh, my recollection is that that would only happen at certain times, because again, people were trying to do. That was the only place you could do sort of, you know, serious work, interactive work with a computer. So that if there were you know, if there were a lot of loud meetings, I mean, you would have meetings out there, but when the meetings were out there, then people typically would not be working on the, on the computers, or at least not as much. So most of the time, it was pretty quiet. Yeah. Um, do you, my sense is that Stuart Brand was only around for a, a very small period of time. Mm -hmm. He wasn't really a member, like in the way that Dave Evans mm -hmm. or, or um, Fetterman mm -hmm. were around. Mm -hmm. but I, um, what kind of an impact did Evans and Fetterman particularly have on what kinds of ideas did they bring in that might not have gotten in elsewise? I think it was a sense of community. I mean, I, I think that, that those, they sort of served in some sense as being not only focal points, but, but enablers for, for a developing community. 
Uh, I mean, that was clearly, especially with Jim, you know, that was clearly why he was there. That was what he had to offer. Uh, and the fact that he was there showed a real concern with that, you know, that, that the real awareness by, by Doug that, that developing a community was important. Uh, and, you know, Dave, I mean, he was just ebullient, but he, that's one of the things he was, always, he was always focusing on is, you know, just sort of moving this forward as a global community. Uh, so, I, you know, I, I would sort of say that they were, the, they were the focus of the community in some sense, or at least they were the, you know, they were, they were the focus of a lot of the community feelings. What kind of stories am I missing? What, you know, what um, are the stories of the romances? <laughs> what else is there that really sort of, um, we've talked about bootstrapping the ARPANET. Uh, are there other things that, that sort of, that Well, there's a, there's a feeling that, that I have and I've had for a long time, and this may not have anything to do with this, uh, but perhaps it does, and that is, it's, it's sort of a feeling about invention, and I think what was going on there was invention. And what that feeling is, is that it's very easy to look back and say, ah, this was invented there, or, you know, this, is, this person invented this, or something like that, and yet, if I look back at the days of ARC and what was going on there, at least in my involvement of it, and I think this is probably true of most people, you didn't feel like that from the inside. That there were a whole lot of people that were interacting and were doing a lot of things, but I don't think anybody would lay claim to any one particular idea or any one thing, uh, you know, with the possible exception of Doug, who, who clearly elucidated his, his vision. Uh, and it was just a, you know, it's a feeling from the inside of, of the fact that there was a team going through and just moving something along. And so they, you know, it's very hard to think of it in terms of discrete events, 